thanks for coming to this talk. We're going to be a little bit of an extension to the talk earlier, going into a bit more details. But we'll be talking about, more generally, how you go about building and deploying LLMs on Databricks Mosaic AI. I'll touch a little bit into DBRX. I know this morning was fairly high level, so talk you, talking a bit more about the details there. Um, just to introduce myself again, my name is Niall Turbot. I'm a senior data scientist on the professional services team. With me, we also have Anastasia, who will be walking you through a nice demo. Hopefully, <laughs> we've got everything sorted there. So just in terms of agenda, a little bit of just recapping on DBRX. In particular, I, I want to unpack a bit more details on architecture itself in terms of the details of what that looks like, how we went about training it, and also then putting it into this a bit of a wider perspective as to obviously you're not going to jump to straight up training a model from scratch on 3,000 GPUs. How do you work your way towards that? Should you even work your way towards that? Um, a lot of the times the answer is no, and I kind of want to guide you through what that ladder looks like. Uh, and then we'll be finishing off with a demo of what it looks like to go from what is a, a, an already trained model, how you could think about fine-tuning that, fine that model, think about incorporating the model into a RAG pipeline, and, and also more broadly what that looks like to deploy on Databricks. Cool, so let me just skip on. So in terms of kind of our vision, what we see as our mission, really it is, it's all about what I was saying earlier in the keynote of unlocking intelligence from data, and, and especially on the model side of things. What this is really trying to achieve is how do we go about building and serving, if needed, custom AI models for our customers using their own unique data to achieve quality? And as I guess it's, it's all about quality in a particular domain. If anyone has used ChatGPT, Claude, these kind of models, obviously very competent, very capable models, but has no intelligence about your own domain, specifically for a lot of enterprises. If you think about in a company, there are different acronyms floating around. How do you instill that knowledge into a model? But also then, not just in terms of efficiently either fine tuning or training a model, how do you go about serving it as efficiently as possible? And really what we want to do is not just say, okay, you have to go and train a model. It's all the way from API calls. And for a lot of cases, it's always start from just making a API calls to assess, is there a solution use case fit for, for the use case at hand? And right the way through to pre-training if and when you need it. So I'll, I'll glance over the introduction of DBRX. It's the open source large language model that we open sourced earlier on in the year. Key thing is that, and that what we're quite proud of really, is that the whole thing was done end to end on Databricks. And this is from the entire and a lot of what the work is of the data preparation, data filter, uh, data filtering, all of the data introspection that you also need there. If you think about the just quantity of data that you're inevitably going to train on, you need to be able to do exploratory data analysis on such a large corpus of data. But how do you do so in a way that actually yields a lot of information? And, and that's the, the thing that we really wanted to kind of explore, whether it was even possible in terms of processing, but that, that exploration as well, but also all the way through to training itself as well, training the model up to thousands of GPUs. A lot of the research team are trying to push for it to be called DBRX, and that's why you have this kind of dinosaur emoji. Um, I'm gonna do DBRX because, uh, yeah, I'm not quite on board with that. So in terms of what is the actual model itself, so like I said, entirely built, trained, deployed on Databricks, an open source model that you don't necessarily need to be on Databricks to actually use. In terms of, at a high level, like everyone's always very concerned about what's the number of parameters. So it is a mixture of experts model, and I'll, I'll go into a bit further what that actually means. But on the face of it, it's 132 billion parameters, of which you have 36, acti 36 billion active parameters. And really what that allows you to achieve is the capacity or the general capabilities of a much larger model. But in terms of that training or inference footprint, it acts as if it's a much smaller model. And this is where you, the way it kind of manifests itself is that kind of very, very speedy inference, but also in terms of optimization at training time. 
it was uh, the kind of best open source model at the time. Uh, Meta obviously then came along with Llama 3 a couple of weeks later. But really, our whole vision was it's not to have the best open source model. I, I, it's kind of raced to the bottom there in terms of having the best open source model. It's again about how can we demonstrate the power of our platform to make sure we have stress tested and battle hardened our actual platform itself so that when our customers inevitably will come to us and say, okay, I want to train my own kind of GPT 3.5 equivalent model that we have the infrastructure in place and that we have kind of assessed how that works and, and make sure that all can be done in a robust uh, manner. There are two variants of, of DBRX in terms of the open source models. There is the base model. You can think of this as if it's a kind of smart autocomplete. So same as any kind of base model, it's going to just predict, continue to predict the next token. Um, ultimately, this kind of base model serves as a good starting point if you want to domain adapt the model. And the way that you can essentially think about fine tuning these open source models, at a high level, you can break it down to one is domain adaptation and then the other is instruction tuning. You might have heard of supervised fine tuning as well. It's the kind of equivalent. So the, the way that you can think about this is for uh, domain adaptation. Think of this if, there, if you're in within an enterprise where there's a lot of acronyms, there's terminology that's very specific to that domain. Taking a base model and just kind of predicting the next token on just a raw corpus of data can work relatively well to basically inject that knowledge of that domain into the model itself. On the other side of things, you then have instruct models. And instruct models essentially take that base model and then further fine tune it on instruction pairs. And so this might be question and answers. It can also be chat templates as well. And DBRX instruct then is that fine tuned version that has been adapted to follow instructions to basically follow that kind of chat template or questions uh, back and forth. I showed this earlier, but this is again a kind of manifestation of the efficiency of the model itself. So not only is it, so training itself is obviously very cost intensive, but for most enterprises, much of the actual cost that is born out of these models is actually inference time. So we put a lot of work into making this as efficient as possible. This is a side by side albeit at the time to, to Lama 2, but it's just to give you a bit of a concept as to the speed against a dense model. And this could be any kind of dense 70 billion parameter model. Just invariably because the active parameters of a mixture of experts model, for each token that you're doing, kind of predicting that output for, there's only that, essentially that kind of smaller footprint of, of parameters that are activated. And you get that speed up uh, at inference time. I showed some of these benchmarks from earlier, but just to kind of cross the board, just comparing how DBRX compares against those other open source equivalents, and very much kind of best in its class in terms of that price per performance. But ultimately, why did we build DBRX? So again, I, I would mention this this morning. It's really to, to bring our platform to the degree or to the to the level of, of robustness that we can have enterprises that come to us and say, okay, I have trillions of my own internal tokens. I mean, and a lot of companies do have that amount of data. They probably don't even know they have that amount of kind of unstructured data that they can train on. And it's getting our platform to the extent where we can have customers come along and if and when they need to pre-train a model from scratch, we can do so and we know that it, we have kind of proven capabilities. You basically, there's a lot of scar tissue built up along the way to, to scale up to those kind of training workloads. So what this talk is, is just gonna be in terms of initially how we went about training it, uh, what that architecture looks like, and then what it looks like to actually go into the, the deployment phase of things. So really truly what we believe is that for enterprises to be successful, especially with open source, it's, it's customizing these models on their own data. And I just want to emphasize that customizing on your own data that's not necessarily just fine tuning. That's, that's anything from prompt engineering through to what we term compound AI systems, which is any kind of gen AI application which has some generative component in the middle of it. So this could be anything from RAG through to agents where there's some aspect of planning involved as well. So the architecture. It is a transformer 
not a shock, transformer-based decoder model. And in terms of the training data itself, it's trained entirely on public data, so no custom, none of our customer data was involved in this. Um, it was 12 trillion tokens. And interesting about the actual tokens that were used, you'll see this point at the bottom about curriculum learning. And essentially what that is, is that during training, you can think of, okay, I have this budget of 12 trillion, trillion tokens that I want to train over. And some of those tokens you're going to be repeating. And for the vast majority of training, yes, you want that data to be of very high quality, I mean, as high a quality as you can, can get. But what you can do is for the majority of training, you can just do predict the next token on just kind of that, that raw corpus. But what you want to do is save, essentially you take, you're taking checkpoints along the way. For that last 10% of data, what curriculum learning shows is that if you basically cycle the highest quality tokens, and you can do this iteratively to actually find out, well, what are my highest quality tokens? But using that last 10% of, of training to basically upsample the higher quality tokens so that you kind of finish off with those. At that point, that's when you have your base checkpoint and then you would take that even further and you might want to do uh, instruction tuning on that and then you, you've likely heard about RLAHF as well. At that point, you could then take it forward with that as well. In terms of the, and this is something that we find with DBRX as well, compared to last year, there was the MPT class of models. With DBRX, what was found was that just in investing a lot of time into quality of data leads to actually saving money in terms of your training costs. And what that means is that you can get to higher quality in terms of your model outputs quicker if you just invest time up front in that quality uh, of data. And this is where this kind of 30% 30 be 30 better token for token, it's effectively you're doing kind of empiric tests to see, okay, if I use this, if, if we use the data set from last year to train that model versus the data set from this year, what accuracy differential can we reach if the model architecture remains the same? In terms of the training infrastructure itself, so it, training, it kind of ran for 40 days, all in on just under 3,100 H100s, but then there's obviously a lot of work around kind of red teaming it, post evaluation, all of this kind of stuff. But yeah, just the thing that we really found out here was the value of investing in that quality data. So I mentioned it's a mixture of experts model. The actual kind of term for it is the fine-grained sparse mixture of experts model. Uh, the kind of TLDR on mixture of experts, I think there's this misconception that just by virtue of the name that you have these multiple models or there's some kind of multiple experts, and that's, it's, I was gonna say it's kind of true, it's actually not, it's, it's not really true. If you think about your, the architecture of, of your just traditional transformer, you have these transformer blocks, and each of these transformer blocks, you typically have your feed forward layer, and really what you're accomplishing with mixture of experts is that you replicate the feed forward layers for how many number of experts that you have. The difference of DBRX compared to the likes of, so Grok and Mixtral are, mixture effect, are both mixture of experts models. Um, also rumored that uh, chat, or that GBD4, GBD3, or uh, yeah, GBD3.5 and 4 are not confirmed, but potentially mixture of experts models. The difference between uh, DBRX and Mixtral Grok is that is the cho the choice of experts. So basically, for each token that goes through the network, of those experts layer, you say for example in ours we have 16 experts and we choose four, and this is where you get the kind of yes you're blowing up the number of parameters, but for each forward pass of each token, you're only activating four of those experts, and where ours is different is that we have 16 choose four, Grok and Mixtral are eight choose two. We just find through testing that having that kind of broader number of experts actually increases the capacity of the model. The other thing that to note here is this dropless implementation. When you have those 
multiple experts, what can often happen during training, is that certain experts are always selected. So, so you have this straggler problem where certain experts in that layer are just never activated. And this can, can lead to bottlenecks and how you do training. And what you want to do is, is ensure that there's a distribution across all of those experts during training itself. And this is where this dropless implementation comes from. The last thing here is just about this model was really designed, developed for our customers to use in that all of the infrastructure that we put around this in terms of governance and auditability, really this is, is tracking how can you trace and know what data goes exactly into the model, in which proportions, everything is tracked on Databricks site to MLflow. So we're leveraging all of those different components all the way. The, the other just things, that, yeah, so this is what I was saying about uh, 16 choose four, and just in terms of the, the capacity, when you're doing eight choose two, so eight experts of which you're activating two, in compared to 16 experts choosing four, you're basically unlocking 64x more, more possible combinations of how you could potentially activate those experts. And ultimately what we found was that leads to, to greater capacity of the models. In terms of, the, there are just some kind of, I guess, technical details here, but embeddings using uh, rope embeddings, just better supported in terms of inference, and then grouped query attention, which is, I think was first pioneered in one of the LAMA models and has become a kind of standard as well. And then lastly, the GPT-4 token, uh, tokenizer. It's a really good tokenizer and it was a case of let's not reinvent the wheel. So in terms of how we built it, so really all of DBRX is the foundations lie on open source. And a lot of these libraries were pre-existing from Mosaic ML before Databricks acquired. However, we have, we have built these out even further. And all of these are open source libraries, albeit we kind of stitched them all together and optimized them a bit further to have the likes of failure handling and all of this kind of thing as well. Um, so on the first, uh, most foremost side, we have Composer. Composer is essentially, it is effectively a wrapper on top of PyTorch FSDP, uh, FSDP, but with additional optimizations that we can then leverage some of the other components here. So it's essentially just a training library that we have. Streaming dataset is a way for us to efficiently stream from cloud storage into, into thousands of GPUs, but to being able to do it in a deterministic way, it handles sharding, it handles caching, checkpointing, all of this kind of stuff. It has to be done super efficiently, especially when you're, you're going up to that scale. So streaming data set is, is one aspect that allows us to do that. LLM Foundry, you can think of this as almost like a recipe book of not just training, but also for evaluations and that full end to end of, okay, I want to take this. It, it, there's a ton of different blueprints and YAMLs in there. It's, it kind of defines, this is my source input, this is the architecture, and, and this is how that, then I want to evaluate. And then for evaluations, essentially what, if you've ever looked into LLM evaluations, there are tons of benchmarks out there, um, some debatable ones to use, and if you actually dig into the actual, uh, a lot of these benchmarks themselves, and, and you look at specific questions and answers, some of them, the fact that we kind of anchor ourselves against those benchmarks can become questionable when you d dive a bit deeper into them. Evaluation Gauntlet is a library which allows us to effectively kind of average across a lot of these and, and quickly conduct those evals. In terms of on Databricks itself, so these are all the different components and you can think of this as left to right in terms of data exploration, for, we used Lilac AI. Lilac AI was, or Lilac as it was previously, was and still is an open source library for uh, data exploration. So you can think of this almost as topic modeling on top of vast amounts of, of unstructured data. We, Databricks, given that we had such a good uh, experience with the Lilac team, then acquired Lilac, and we're starting to, to bake that into the product itself to be able to do that. Uh, that large scale, unstructured data, pre well, data exploration. In terms of pre-processing the data, we had Spark, 
unique catalog, which allows us to manage and govern between models and data. We then had uh, what we term Mosaic Multi-Cloud Training, MCT, to do the actual training on our platform itself. And then MLflow is used all the way through in order to, to track everything out in terms of parameters, configs, all of this kind of stuff. So just lastly, open source is, is super important here. And, and all of this process was really founded on a, lot, on a lot of pillars of open source. So Megablocks is what well, was a Stanford project. We have now adopted that project to basically support it a bit further. It's a library that assists training mixture of experts models, PyTorch FSDP. All of our distributed training uses uh, PyTorch FSDP. The team worked really closely there with the PyTorch team in order to do a lot of the optimizations needed to achieve good training with mixture of experts. Our inference stack then, in terms of that the model serving side of things, is VLLM and TensorRT from NVIDIA. And a lot of open source uh, communities such as Luther AI uh, and Allen Institute as well were, were very influential. So just lastly, I want, want to quickly just actually set, well, when should you actually go by training a custom LLM? Because for a lot of folks working up to that is actually, it should be an entire process. I would say always first, just take an off the shelf API it could be GPT, could just be a like, DBRX endpoint, and always test that out for your, for your use case, and slowly work your way up through this ladder. It says a thousand shot here. I would say multi-shot, few shot prompting, which is basically providing examples within the prompt of the model, working your way up to fine tuning. And you can think of each ladder here as being something that you progressively work your way to, as and when you think, okay, I've reached a certain threshold of performance. And one thing that I'm gonna stress as I build this out is just evals, having good evals along the way. If you do not have good evals, you don't have a target to aim for, you don't have a benchmark to say, okay, I'm now achieving better than this. Each one of these requires an extra step up in compute in terms of, uh, I guess, complications that you could potentially encounter. However, with each step up here, Oftentimes, you can unlock that kind of extra le level of just uh, performance and quality. So going through fine tuning, continue pre-training, again, what I was saying about domain adaptation. Curriculum learning is where you essentially start to figure out, well, what is my high quality data? I'm going to iteratively and dynamically train on it, and then right the way through to pre-training a model from scratch. So if you have an entirely custom corpus that you might need to pre-train from scratch, then that is that is a, a significant decision to make, but one that, that we, we have and, and can work through with customers. Evaluation is so important all along the way. Lilac AI is, is really good for essentially extracting insights from that just a vast corpus of information and being able to then track things with Unity Catalog with MLflow as well. And the one thing that you want to think about is this kind of trade-off between quality, cost, and performance. There could be a ton more dots here. I know there's no Mistral, and you could scatter dots everywhere here. But the point still holds is that as you work your way up the quality of the model, you're work working your way up cost. And this could be a proxy for both training, for both inference as well as that. It becomes more costly to serve these models as well. So just to to finish off here, because I do want to give Anastasia time to come up and give a, a, a demo of what this looks like on Databricks, is that any of these, I think the question is all, it, the question I get most from customers is, when should I do RAG? When should I do fine tuning? When should I just do prompt engineering? And the point is that, it's kind of the wrong question, it's that all of these things can be done in conjunction with each other. First start out with just prompt engineering. That can then be combined with RAG. You can do few shot learning and RAG, fine tuning, fine tuning a model plus RAG as well. All of these stuff can be combined. And the way that you want to do is kind of work your way up that curve of addressing, okay, I'm willing to pay this much and this is the, the quality that I'm able to get from that. Cool, so just to show a bit, a bit of what this looks like on our platform itself, we do believe that, that we are the only platform that you can go from all the way of preparing your data, 
to fine tuning a model, to using APIs right the way through to if you need pre-training a model from scratch and having that all with all in one platform. So I'm gonna invite Anastasia up who's just going to show us a bit of a flavor for what that looks like on Databricks. Cool. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hopefully it will work because we had to switch computers, so sorry for this. So um, we're gonna short it a bit, but the goal is for you to actually understand how to use tools that you learn about today. You know, um, I don't know if any of you went to, uh, you know, hear the talk from Llama Index. During the keynote, you've seen a hugging face, right? So all of these are tools. So how can actually you put these tools into the production? Uh, what we really try to solve Databricks is not just, you know, like I take a model and I kind of, I don't know, test it in my computer, but how can you actually bring everything to production? How can you track things? How can you govern your data? So that's what we try to build. And on top of this, we try to help people really to go and scale for really a cheap price, right? Because what we actually have seen, and I've been uh, the witness of this, is that a lot of my customers started abuse using uh, ChatGPT. And they were like, oh, why would I deploy my own model? ChatGPT is so cheap. I just pay like 002 cents for this. Well, that was okay when they had 1,000 tokens. And when they moved to billions of them per day, they would be like, oh, wow, that's actually cost me way more than this project bringing money back. And they call us back and said, hey, how about fine tuning my own model? Because, well, it's very expensive using ChatGPT in production. So, you know, sometimes foundational models, it's not only about like sort of having your own, but it's also about actually like really um, bringing them to production because at the end of the day, doing a POC versus really deploying stuff and tracking them and governing all your data, that's very different. So uh, very quickly, if you never use Databricks or at least you want to start using, but you're not sure uh, how to start, we actually uh, packaging a lot of different solutions from data ingestion to fine tuning and RAG into what we call a demo center, all right? All of these demos are pip installations, so you can just do pip uh, install db demo and then you're gonna bring back the notebook. So that's what I tr will try to demo to you today. I already executed most of the things, so I'm just gonna show you a few very important components. First of all, I just wanted to remind that most of the tools that Databricks is built on are open source, right? So I would like to share with you how can you, for example, track your long chain chains or any chains using Amoflow tracing. There have been recently a new tracing tool that's been released, again, open source, so you can install it in your local computer and use it. Of course, you will not have the same security and governance access controls you would have on Databricks, but apart this, all the other tools are available. We recently also open sourced uh, Unity Catalog, the governance tool that Databricks is using, and Delta Lake and Apache Spark been open source for years, right? So, um, overall, as Niall explained you, right, there is diff different curve of maturity, so usually you would start from prompt engineering, and then you would definitely do RAG, and whenever you want to improve the quality of the model for RAG, you definitely will fine-tune or pre-train. Um, please, something that I see a lot of his customers, and I would like to mention it one more time, do not try to put personal information data and to expect the fine-tuned model to answer you the exact answer as RAG. This is not the purpose of fine-tuning, actually. Mainly we fine-tune for bringing certain concepts or instructions into the model rather than actually bringing the actual data, okay? For actual data, use a normal database and a vector database to extract it from RAG. So um, what I will try to show you today is, first of all, how to track and build your chains using open source standard code, right? So you just have a database, you're putting it into vector database. In this case, we're gonna use a new vector database from Databricks called Vector Search. But in reality, all of these examples could work with any database, okay? It can be Milvius, it can be ChromaDB, it can be Fice Library, anything. The goal, again, of uh, the open source code is to use any tool, right? In this case, uh, we're using the new Databricks tool, but apart the this one, you can actually replicate everything on your own. So um, what I'm going to show you, first of all, is how can you uh, basically log your chains and how can you deploy um, you know, your, your database. So I'm going to skip the data prep. Data prep was very basic, okay? We used some Python, some Spark, and we saved it on the Delta table. If you do not know what is Delta table, it's really a parquet with certain metadata and it looks like a table. That's why we call it table, but in reality it can store structured and structured data. It can be on uh, batch streaming and also online uh, inferences, okay? So it's a super cool acidic tool. If you didn't use it yet, I um, highly recommend it. 
So what I wanted to show is how can actually you now log your chains. This is a very new tool for AML flow. We heard about weights and biases. So we also now have it for open source AML flow. So this is a my config for a normal prompt engineering, right? Uh, we often have some temperature for the models. Then we have, of course, our prompt template. It's very important the way we prompt in the model because depending on the way you're asking something, you're going to have a different answer, right? So usually it's very important for us to trace them. Otherwise, we're going to just be lost in a variety of these templates and this temperature and different parameters for models. So once uh, you kind of have actually your uh, config file and you created your chain, and my chain is a simple uh, long chain code, you know, there is no magic in it. Probably if any of you ever deployed a rag, uh, you've already been using it. The main difference in this code is that um, in a, as a vector database retrieval, we're using our uh, Databricks vector database. But as you pay attention into the code, it's a very classic code where you actually just import in a class from Langchain or Llama index. You connect in your retrieval or your model, and then write, you just deploy in a chain. So this is very classic one. As you've probably seen it before, there is really no, um, nothing new to you. You can transfer any code that you had. So how can you now log it into MLflow? It's actually super simple. So now we support a new flavor, um, a long chain. But on top of this, what we now support is actually config and in chain itself. So once it's actually done and you uh, evoke your model back, what's happening is that it's actually giving you a trace. So now we can actually have a full trace of every step that we have in our model. Uh, with different executable time. So what is the goal of those? So this is kind of called a spin, so it's, this is an, a new ML flow tracing. You can trace not just actually uh, the long chain models, okay? So today you can actually trace any function using those decorators for the spin, right? It can be different um, kind of inherited functions uh, for pre-processing, of course, for chains, it's very useful because we usually have many steps and we need to know and exactly trace the each step. But as you see, it can be uh, a very useful and super cool tool for us to verify what is actually executed after which step. So this one was created automatically, but you can also actually uh, create your own decorators, your own classes. You know, it's fully inheritable, so you don't have to actually follow like uh, the default one. So once this is done, what we've been actually thinking a lot through is how to actually, you know, um, bring this to some real domain users, right? The main problem is all of these applications today is not just that uh, people create a code and it's never used, is that usually people who are using it do not have access to those platforms, right? They never have access to your computer and they somehow need to provide you feedback. So feedback and evaluation, it's very important. So something that I actually already run here and I just wanted to quickly show you is the evaluation. So why evaluation is so important is because we actually always will um, be worrying about human feedback, right? Human feedback is super important. And we hearing actually more and more about reinforcement learning and human feedback um, kind of evaluation and also incorporation into your fine tuning. So how to reach it, uh, how actually get users the access. So, First of all, the simplest way of actually um, sort of verifying anything, again, you can use what we call MLflow Evaluate, right? So MLflow Evaluate, it's actually a super simple uh, tool that I just need to find, sorry. Yep. So uh, MLflow Evaluate helps you to actually uh, automatically uh, leverage what we call LLM as a judge. So what is LLM as a judge if you, again, um, never yet uh, use this, I highly recommend you to check it out from Databricks. This is not something that Databricks created, but we heavily leverage in it under the ML flow. So overall, LLM is a judge. It's something that's gonna use an, a model, a very smart generated AI model, to play a human. So you're gonna actually prompt and give examples and certain, basically, rules for LLM to evaluate your rug. Right, we already heard a lot that today there is a lot of this re-evaluation, re, re -chunking. So this is what we actually incorporated under the, um, under the ML flow. So I highly recommend reading this blog post by our engineers and product managers that actually um, talking how did we create this LLM evaluation, LLM as a judge. Overall, empirically we measured that the best evaluation can be uh, by grading the model from zero to five. 
And what we actually do is that we letting you to write uh, rules and scores. So you can actually write a template where you say, for me, the score zero equals, equals this. For me, the score one equals that. And then you can actually evaluate it on professionalism and, ac and accuracy. On top of this, we also letting you to incorporate more functionalities. For example, it can be perplexity, it can be relevancy score, it can be anything. It can be also toxicity, right? counting tokens. So in reality, you can really incorporate a lot of things. Um, once all of this is sort of evaluated, actually this is going to create you a table that you can later save and you can actually monitor this table. It doesn't have to be only monitored in Databricks. You can save it. You can expose it to any domain users. Uh, but it's super important to have all of these traces together. So once the traces are done, what actually can you do next is also the, the things that we sort of seen is by creating a very simple UI for external users, right? So we call it Evaluation Suite today. Uh, this is a tool that Databricks kind of published under what we call Databricks Agents. So again, you're just giving instructions to users, and then later it would actually create you an application where people can ask questions, OK? So basically, this is the instruction for users. So once a user opening it, so now I'm playing a Nile who is actually going to use my application that I've deployed. And then you can actually start chatting with the bot. So I hope my endpoint is not dead, but let's see. So basically, what this agent is doing, it's taking the model that I just showed you. And under the hood, it's going to create a serving a container, a concurrent serving container on Databricks using a model serving on Databricks. It's going to create you all the UI. On top of this, it's going to also deploy what we call a payload login. So what is the payload login? Basically, everything that I'm asking actually going to be logged together with the answers into the delta table. Later, when the delta table is created, you can actually build a monitor dashboard, again, on quality of answers, on the length of the answer. OK, so um, So for example, here I'm asking him to create me a delta table with some uh, little uh, error in grammar. And then you see it's basically uh, creating us, the, uh, bringing us the code back. So probably you guessed that this is a rug application about Databricks or some manuals from Databricks. And you see here we also providing you actually a feedback loop. So basically, whenever the user wants to verify it, whether they're actually technical or not, they could just provide uh, a feedback that, again, also going to be recorded that can be later re-evaluated and reused for improvement of your models. Um, so you can have uh, many chats, and then you can, again, compare them back. So I just maybe wanted to show you very quickly how actually this is all looks under your catalogs, you know, because um, the thing is that what is very simple for at least uh, ML engineers or data engineers, data scientists on Databricks, it's actually the governance and how actually we led you to basically create all of this um, unification around, um, oops, sorry, where is my rug chatbot? Yeah, so as you see, we have a lot of uh, different tables, a lot of different volumes, so, and also a lot of different models. So, for example, uh, whenever you have a delta table, this is just a simple table. You can have a sample, ex a sample data, right? So as you see, I have ID, I chunk some data, and I have some content. Now I actually want to have a vector database to quickly uh, prototype and test my rack. So on Databricks, you can simply create a vector database just by literally filling five lines. You can also, of course, deploy it with the SDK. So our solution is actually auto-scalable, and fully managed, meaning that you actually don't have to do anything apart uh, chunking your data. Today, you don't even have to convert anymore your text to embeddings. You can just deploy any model of your choice uh, of embeddings on Databricks or use our, actually, FM API. So it's pre-deployed models, token-based, like OpenAI, ADA. We only provide in open source models, no proprietary models. But you can also connect any proprietary if you wish. So you just fill in uh, all of this information and after literally a few minutes, of course, depending on the uh, size of your uh, data set, you get in a vector database that is actually um, real time, meaning it's a REST API endpoint that you can access from anywhere. It's auto scaling, meaning that whatever the size of index you get up to, of course, a uh, certain size, which is 100 millions of indexes for us, is going to scale. 
and it's fully inheriting permissions from Unity Catalog. It's based on Delta Life on Delta tables, and under the hood, it's using serverless Delta Life tables for syncing your uh, updates. What does it mean? Meaning, whatever new data is ingested under Delta table, you actually don't have to take care of any updates. You just click on Sync Now or Execute the SDK, and it's going to update your vector database. We also support Insert. So right now, we support only semantic search, but we're also going to support um, sparse search, keyword search uh, for a more uh, common one. And you can actually call it from anywhere. You don't have to be Databricks users as it's REST API. You just need to have authentication uh, rights, and you can actually basically apply to uh, any, of your, uh, any of your application to any platform that you have. So I think I'm probably already on time. Yes, so please. yeah, uh, thanks a lot for coming. Sorry for not showing you everything, but hopefully you get a bit of a flavor about what Databricks offering. <laughs> okay. And yeah, if you have any questions, we can take them later. Thank <laughs> you.